hit the go live button. Looks like awesome. we are showing up on Restream, Dave, so I'll let you take the mic. Fantastic. Everyone, uh, welcome to Manufacturing Hub. Uh, you may or may not have heard Vlad say that for this special first roundtable we've ever done, he's also introduced like 20,000 additional variables to the Rube Goldberg machine, which is how we make it from the spots where we are. Uh, on Earth, through the internet, to the spots where you are. So uh, everyone should both be excited and scared, which is the most appropriate way uh, to talk about this safety roundtable. As everyone comes in, uh, I've got a couple of the normal uh, comments that we normally do, that we have. Again, we want to thank uh, Phoenix Contact and, and Zach. Zach is somewhere on your screen. I uh, wave to everyone, Zach. We want to thank Phoenix Contact Hi. and Zach uh, for helping to sponsor August which is a little bit of, uh, which is a few uh, round tables, uh, some career conversations, some supply chain, and, and a whole bunch more. Um, yeah, uh, so without that, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, everyone, welcome to the first Manufacturing Hub round table. Uh, on Manufacturing Hub, I'm Dave, and Vlad is going to wave his hands and introduce himself in a minute. Uh, th this is Vlad. Uh, we run a weekly uh, Wednesday afternoon show where we talk about all things manufacturing. As I mentioned, uh, this is our first round table. Uh, we're here to talk about safety. If you guys are long-term watchers of the show, you have seen Zach a couple of times and John at least once. And with both of these guys, for whatever reason, the conversations of safety continue to come up and, and everyone's perceptions versus reality of what is actually safe, yeah, air quotes, actually safe, on a plant floor versus what do the regs and specifications say is safe. Th there's sometimes a bit of a difference, right? A, a little bit of a gap in there. And so we, we want to have this conversation. Uh, if you guys are new to this, uh, please feel free to go ahead and comment, uh, both comments and questions in here. We're going to do about 45 minutes or an hour of round table. If we've got a chance to grab your comments in there, we'll do them there. Otherwise, we're going to have a little bit more free form uh, towards the back end, like uh, like a more typical show. So please feel free to early often go ahead and drop comments in there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead, uh, let everyone go around, kind of give a, give a brief introduction, and then we will kind of continue to go into it. Uh, Zach, would you like to go first? Sure thing. Thanks, Dave. My name is Zachary Stank. I am a product marketing manager at Phoenix Contact and based out of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is where our headquarters is for the United States. I'm responsible for control, safety, IO, HMI, and IPC for the U.S. And this is my third time, and I'm glad to be here just uh, one week too uh, late to be the first three-timer, but I appreciate <laughs> you guys having me on anyway. So. Awesome. As thank always. You, yes, thank you, Zach. John, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I am John Pillar. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. I am John Pillar. Let's start that over again. I... Uh, and have my own uh, consulting, uh, John J Pillar Design and Consulting, also sometimes called Ganau. Um, I do machine controls and automation consulting with that. I'm also working as director of field support for a company called Alcatraz AI, doing video analytics on card access right now. So cool. Very good. And can you us. give everyone a, a bit of a highlight of, of your safety background? Because because you have a slightly different angle than everyone else. I a slightly different angle. I've been doing automation and controls for 20 years, but I'm also mm -hmm. on the technical writing committee for NFPA 79. So that I think is uh, where you're pushing there. So yeah, absolutely. There Thank you, John. And Vlad, can you remind everyone of who you are and tell everyone the role that you're going to play in this? Sure, I guess so. The short intro is that I've been in automation and manufacturing for close to a decade now. I've done all kinds of integrations, primarily on the PLC, HMI, and SCADA developments. That being said, today I do have a lot of questions based on my previous experiences, so to speak, in safety and in that realm. And again, we're going to dive in deeper into this, but I've seen, as I've told Dave and the rest of the guests on the stream is that I've seen the good and the bad of safety. So we're going to demystify that and uh, get into that in just a few moments. Awesome. Thank you, Vlad. And for any new viewer or listener, every time you hear Vlad say, I have a lot of questions, you should know that you should be very scared. It happens almost every show and is the middle block in the, uh, in the manufacturing hub bingo card. Uh, so, so Vlad, you were talking about good and bad of safety. You were talking about demystifying it. Do you want to kick us off on, on maybe some of the experiences that, that you've had and the questions of what is safe versus what, what might not be safe? 
Absolutely, Dave. And so I think the first starting point, right, to paint a picture is I've observed that depending on the employer, or the company that you go to work for, there's going to be a various level of safety, right? So in certain companies, safety first actually means something. There's going to be very tight practices on lockout, tagout. So basic principles, I want to say like lockout, tagout, machine safety, it's going to be almost impossible to bypass anything, right? And in other companies, well, there's going to be some corner cutting, so to speak, or at least like from what I've seen in those plants, it would be, well, like, can we bypass this so we can just run the machine for now and address it later? So there's there's going to be a lot of nuances like that. But the first question I think, or fundamentally as a controls engineer that comes into my mind is what are the different levels of safety? So a lot of times in a plant, they will tell you, well, we have like a level four safety or we have a level three safety. Like, could you maybe... Uh, walk us through that, John, uh, maybe first, and then Zach, like, what are your impressions of different safety levels? And not impressions, I guess, what are the definitions? But also, what should controls engineers be aware of and know when it comes to that? Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Softball, John. Softball. Softball. That was that was actually heavy. So NFPA doesn't have safety levels like that. So what you're talking about is, I think you're referring to the SIP levels and in each of those that's a different that's so that's uh i believe an iso standard so you've got to go through the process and when you're asking these questions which safety standards am i going to meet and which safe safety regulations are we going to roll with um uh and when we were chatting before the before we started going here live too you made a comment about um i think you made a term on regulations and mm -hmm. and and like law that's another question entirely. To be honest, in, in most of the Midwest, there isn't a law on industrial control panels. It doesn't fit into NFPA 70, which is the NEC. It's NFPA 79, which isn't law. So so the that's that's kind of where that's coming from in some of that. I know in Canada, that's a little different. Um, and I believe up in the Northeast, NFPA 79 is part of their legislative uh, branch. And so the authority having jurisdiction can have say and stoppage on that so um a lot of what you come into is exactly where you were driving i think um what is the culture of the company and all the way down to even what is the insurance company that your company uses forcing you to do what do you think zach no i i agree and, and the key term there is law vlad um because in the united states law is osha and so when you're talking about federal law and responsibilities, that is determined by the OSHA standard of what is directly affecting worker safety, right? And so um, you start at the federal level and then you go down to the state level. So if you have a state level OSHA or you have state regulations, like John was saying, if NFPA 79 is part of your jurisdiction and you need to follow things there, you must do it. Um, but that can be confusing because not everybody is that familiar with it. If you go to, uh, uh, I think it's OSHA.gov and look up 1910 subpart O, which is machine standards. Um, they have a lot, oh, it's actually not that much. It's like nine standards outlined for like cooperage, uh, abrasive mills, um, a couple other things. But generally OSHA doesn't incorporate standards into law um, like you would assume they would. Uh, it is pretty much hands off and then they leave it to the national standards bodies to say, this is what you should be doing and you shall be doing in some situations where it's required. So getting back to your other question is what it what safety levels are there? It depends on what standard you're following as your overall safety guidance. So you have um, the IEC 6, um, 61508, which is uh, process typically Oriented, that's your SIL standard. Um, you have individual ones, like so for chemical processes, you'd be 61511, which is specifically for chemical processes. And then you have uh, the international 13, uh, oh, no, 13, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I say it all the time, but it's the, it's the, that's the performance level standard that you would see normally everywhere else. That's less accepted in the United States because it's not directly talked about by OSHA but you have uh, national standardization bodies like the RIA bringing it into their robot and you know mobile guided vehicle type 
of, of applications. So the answer to your question, Vlad, is there's a lot of things you have to go through to determine what's required. And it's not always an easy, you know, cake to slice. Let me ask you maybe like a, a fundamental question as a follow up, right? Because from what I understand, there's obviously like a safety standard on the process side, right? Like, so how do we use controls to protect whoever's operating machinery or again, from the chemicals and maybe like a more uh, chemical type oriented process, but there's also a standard for how, let's say like an e-stop should be wired. How does the e-stop circuit respond to like an event, right? Like, so that's going to be more on the NFPA 79 where that would fall, if I'm not mistaken, or SIL, like different, there's different levels, right? Like of what that's going to look like. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle this one first, John, and then you can comment off of it since okay, cool. uh, you, you sit on the board um, for the technical writing. So I would say NFPA 79 does describe what an e-stop is and should be within its, its contents. I don't think it tells you specifically application-wise how you should be applying an e-stop or where it needs to be on your machine specifically but it does give you the definition of what an emergency stop is and the different stop categories that are, are achievable. So that's stop category zero, which is instantaneous, stop category one, which is uh, delay with then removal of power and stop category two, which is usually not used for an emergency stop because it is just a delayed stop with no removal of power. So it, <laughs> I, I hate to say that it's a lot to tackle in a one hour conversation, but it is a lot to tackle in a one hour conversation. But yeah. No, but, so yeah. Go ahead, let me, let me, let me embellish a bit on that. So a zero and a one RE stops by definition, because it's removal of power. So by, by the code, the emergency stop is removal of power. They're all three stops, right? It's a, it's a square and a rhombus kind of a deal there. The stop category two is just power off, power on. That's a stop. So it does state that every machine is required to have a category zero. So you can have a machine that has only an e-stop that pulls power, or or you can have a, a category zero and a two, which is more likely what you do because you turn it off, turn it on. Um, and then the category one, as Zach was alluding to, is something of, it is too difficult. It is more dangerous. It is determined more dangerous by whatever measure you define more danger is to remove the power before physically stopping the motion. So think a flywheel. So a flywheel is going to go if you, you have to break it first, stop it, and then disconnect power. That's what a one is. So what we describe is how are those two three operations gone into? And it says that you have to have a zero because you have to be able to pull the power. And, and then the other piece that I want to say to what you just asked, when you think about of a machine, I think a machine, right? Then there's a process that the machine does. That's a different safety problem. That's a different list of safety specs. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of where you go at it. I'm electrical, right? So I think all my electrical safety all the way down to the motor and then past that, really, that's the process control guy telling me, what needs to be done safe there, right? The chemicals, those things, those have safety regulations, but it's not part of the machine, right? If that makes any sense. Yeah, I think I, I think that definitely makes sense. Let me, as a follow-up, I guess, because I, I think like the devil's always in the details and I like the way you, you phrased it, right? Like at that category, you're supposed to drop power, right? And I've seen that and again, I've not read the official definition and I'm by no means a lawyer, but in the field, I've seen various yes, interpretations. You are a controls engineer. You are a lawyer. Right. <laughs> I mean, so. Next week, Vlad is going to law school. So I'm that sorry. I didn't mean to step on you there. <laughs> but I guess like to formalize that question, right? So I've seen dropping power implemented in many ways, right? So some take it as we're going to drop the power of, let's say, of your drive that goes to the motor. Some may drop a contactor that kind of delivers power. Some may drop the power of the entire panel. Are there like explicit, I want to say like nuances in those standards? And my, my assumption is like, yes, but how do we 
I guess like you'd have to refer back to it in order to figure out what exactly it is and is it as open to interpretation as I've seen it be in the field. So so it's disconnecting means of power. So it's not just dropping power, it's a physical disconnect. And this is where this is where that wireless question which I think we'll address mm -hmm. here a little bit. But that's where I that's where I sit with that problem and I'll tell you that there is a serious amount of questions in the committee on what that means too, because technology is changing, right? That being said, it's a physical disconnect of power. That's why you have to open that contact. And it's a physical disconnect of power, removing the capability of movement. So if, you, if, if you're if you asking the question of, do I drop the power at the top of the VFD or at the bottom of the VFD? Who cares? It stops movement of the motor, right? That's mm. that's the result. Do I drop power at the you know the service entrance of the machine? Stops stops power, right? It achieves the action. So the purpose of code, the purpose of the NFPA, is not to tell you how to engineer it. It's to tell you the minimum requirements for proper craftsmanship. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and I would say, Vlad, that you know, getting into because you're talking about two different concepts is what is required versus how do I design it? Yeah. And, and the design can be very different depending on who you're talking to and in, depending on what country you're in and depending on what customer you're talking to. Cause you know, we sell components that go into machines that ultimately get sold to an end user, you know, and, and they would use them. In the United States, the end user is responsible for the safety of the machine. So by, by definition, whoever buys the machine is responsible for making sure that it is safe, right? And so the second that it leaves my dock and goes and hits your dock and we complete payment, it is no longer my problem, you know, to, to worry about how that machine is being used. And that's kind of opposite of the way everyone else in the world sees safety. Um, so there's a little bit of onus on on the ownership of the machine, the the safety, health, and environmental team at each facility of what's required, and it's kind of that free market system where, you know, if you know what is required, you're already looking at the the specs of the machine, and you won't buy something that isn't safe. It is kind of the thought process behind it. I would say that's not entirely true, <laughs> but. It, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, if it's going to cost me an extra $200 for a specific safety function, that might go to a purchaser, that might go to a, a VP. It depends on who's making the decision, you know, to whether or not that's needed. And ultimately, what is needed in the United States is not explicitly talked about in any standard, in, unless it is the bare minimum, like, like John was saying, you must have a stop category zero on your machine. Right. And, you know, uh, you, you get then into, you know, I keep going back to the RIA because the RIA is fantastic at going through and showing specifically what, what needs to be stopped, how it needs to be stopped, what standards they're talking about when they do it and how you should go about designing your specific machine. That's kind of where you get into the details of, I really need to read up more and specifically on what I'm doing. So that I know that I'm buying the correct thing, or if I'm manufacturing it, I'm doing it the right way. And, and let me add that you must have an e-stop zero. That's only because this document says so, but nobody has made this document law. So what it that must um, is a, is a different must, right? But I guess yep. like you still have the legal repercussions from the OSHA side, like right if, if something were to happen. Legally. Yeah. So th th yeah, that that's so this is again the minutia of it, Vlad, is if something were to happen. So it, it doesn't mean and I and I don't want anybody out there listening to this say that I don't have to do it as long as there's not a problem. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the enforcement arm of the United States that, that what I'm talking about that goes through and, and checks this is the OSHA inspector. And generally the OSHA inspector is not going to ask you on a properly working machine show me the design and the safety concept for this machine, they will most likely look for spills, scaffolding, hazards, and then make sure you have an e-stop. 
And, and it's not, I'm not, I'm not trying to throw shade on any ocean inspectors out there. Anybody that's looking, they have a very difficult job to do all this, but generally in the United States, you are not fined by OSHA and on a machine safety until there's a near miss or an accident. Interesting. I, I think that this is interesting. I, I feel like 30% of Vlad's questions about e-stops could be answered by go Vlad going to read the specifications, which makes me want to ask a question to, to the chat is how many people have gone and actually read specifications for safety or otherwise in, in their, their area and field of study. So in my background in aviation, there's like, I don't know, a thousand page book of uh, FARs, right? And so uh, J John is shaking his head. Um, if you've gone and done aviation or aerospace or if you've done, gone and done pharmaceutical or any of those other like very controlled um very very controlled areas i don't know it, it's kind of allowed me to, to go and enjoy not having to sift through a thousand pages of documentation and try to understand what someone in 1956 actually meant and how i'm supposed to apply it to technology that is completely different to uh, to what is written uh, in the documentation. So I, I'm interested to know who has actually gone through and read all of those. I think it also gives uh, all the groups uh, interesting opportunities. Uh, John, maybe you could convince them to put like together a nice infographic or maybe a TikTok channel. I think Vlad would happily be, uh, I think Vlad would happily be the controls engineer in, in a TikTok channel if we wanted to go put that together on what knee stop is and, and how we should do things. And maybe we can go layer and maybe, maybe this is a better way to design it. Um, so I, I think all of that is interesting. I, I kind of want to move us away from e-stops because I promised everyone we would spend no more than five hours today arguing about e-stops. So <laughs> l l let's slightly move away from e-stops. Uh, Vlad brought up an interesting point, right? He said that, and, and when I, when he says safety, I think of like culture, like the safety culture of an organization varies significantly from organization to organization. Uh, Vlad, do you, do you maybe have an example? So I, I'd, I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. Vlad, you perhaps have an example of, of a, either some good safety culture or some bad safety culture. And then as a follow-up, do you see that being kind of who owns and runs the company kind of setting that tone? Or do you see it being different? Like larger companies are generally better, smaller companies are generally worse. Uh, can, can I get your thoughts on that, please? Sure. I mean, I'm not going to mention any specific uh, employers, but you could probably go into my history and find out who I'm talking about. Uh, that being said, one of the, I want to say like largest um, home goods companies like has had like the best safety standards from what I've seen. And the example that I gave even on your post, Dave, is that I've seen personally people being walked off the floor for not locking out properly. Right. And so to me, that that says, first of all, like the circuitry was very well designed. And that was going to be my question next, like for Zach and, you know, like John, but it's involving the right professionals to design the systems. And then the principles that were set by the company were almost like law, right? Like, so if you were to break any one of those standards, you were just walked off the floor. And I'll give you the contrast I've seen in other plants, as I've mentioned a little bit earlier, where you would almost be Ex almost explicitly, I don't want to say like explicitly asked, but hey, can we like bypass the safety circuit so we can run at le until like the next shift till like we get a part? And that was just, you know, almost like common practice. So I think to bring this back to your question on culture, it has to be at all levels, right? So in, in the first example that I've mentioned, it's your like managers, your let's say engineers, your operators, supervisors, it's almost you talk to your colleagues and like no one even thinks about like breaking that law because everyone kind of knows the repercussions and everyone designs to that. And the, you know, what we do is not worth getting hurt over is the mentality, right? Like, so no one, there's, there's not a question for us to do something wrong so that we could run a little bit like faster or be more productive, right? Whereas in the other company, it was almost as soon as you slip up like once, I feel that then you instill in the people, well, like we can cut a few like other corners, we can change a few other things. And then the, hey, can we bypass this till tomorrow morning it becomes like, hey, like that's been bypassed the last, the last six months and like no one's really ordered the part and that's just the, the standard, right? So anyways, that's that's kind of my comment. And that's why I said maybe the, the better or worse uh, were some of the environments that I've seen, but yeah. 
John, can uh, can we get your thoughts? Uh, ha- have you seen kind of similar things with organizations? Is that good safety culture breeds good safety culture? It it is it is all about the culture, right? So when it when it comes down to it, you're you're going to be forced to do it because your boss said so, or there's dollars that are forcing you to do it, right? Mm-hmm. And that, and that that's unfortunate, but but it, it's 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 just what pushes either way. Um, the individual operator wants to go home, right? So that's that's good, but they're mm-hmm. not the one that's making the decisions on the safeties along the way. So um, it it is all about how culture is formed within that company. It, it can be the operators gather together and say, I'm not going to run this machine until, and I've seen that also, right? I mean, I don't know how many of you have seen that. I I, I was at a spot where um, that there, there was a potential of, of a measurable incident that you can't see right i i'm not going to go but but if you can't see the problem but you know it's a problem if something is done wrong here and we have sensors that are indicating that i don't have a sensor it's not here i'm not running this today because not only do Mm -hmm. i get hurt everybody else could get hurt down that line and so they're they stood there and said not running it today and it it gets fixed that way along along the time too so i think safety is not only the culture of of the business, but also the culture of the, the worker that's doing it, if that answers too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that, Doc, what are your you thoughts? Know, I, I was just going to say, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, we're all talking kind of the same language here that when you say safety is first, and, and that is people like to say that for a lot of things, safety first, you actually have to believe that. Like if I'm an owner and I believe safety is first, and I have a malfunctioning safety part or my machine is not working because of a safety part, it's not just do it. It is, I must be conscious and say, we need to get this fixed, right? And not say, well, how does this affect production? The the second you start saying, but in safety is the second you stop doing safety, right? Like, oh, I, I shouldn't reach across here, but I will, or, this door is really bugging me, but I need to get in here and, and that kind of stuff. So it, like John was saying, it starts with, it starts with everybody. It, it needs to be taken seriously. If, if, if you're an employee and you're out there and you're in an unsafe situation and you don't feel safe doing something, don't do it. Um, don't ever do it. And, and if, if they force you to do it, and I know this is tough, you know, when we're talking about, you know, employment and being at a place, that is what OSHA is for. That it is honestly for the protection of the worker that if you are being forced into an unsafe situation, you need to report that. And and also your company, if they have a proper SHE or EHS or whatever you're going to call it, safety, health and environmental person, that should be the first person you call immediately if there is something that is unsafe that is happening or you're being forced into an unsafe situation. If that doesn't exist at your company, then I would say your company does not take safety seriously. Maybe they have a an overall safety view of what you know they think is safe, or they have a you know you know safety is our priority and and whatever they're saying and, and the signs are everywhere. But as a worker, you should feel empowered not to do things that are not safe. Um, but that also, it, like I said, it, it it is from the top down because as an owner, you need to if you're really embracing safety and you truly have a safety culture, you need to be concerned about your employees. And, and honestly, it's not. It's not just about the employees too. If you have a totally safe environment, you are going to keep producing. You're going to have machines that are running safely and not stopping. The best safety system, I always say, the best safety system is one that you never see or never know is there. It doesn't interfere with work and it protects you at all times. The worst safety system that you could have is one that is constantly no- making noise or doing things or annoying an operator. So it <laughs> it's really on everybody involved to make sure that safety is a priority. And it is it is very much a cultural thing, and and it's a, a learn thing on the on the floor. Every time, you know, every time there is a miss case or or something happens, and someone says, "Don't worry about it," or all that happens all the time, that is an indication that things are not right, and you need to start working to it. Or, or you know, I would go as far as saying find employment elsewhere, um, because I I've been on site in facilities where we were doing. I mean, sales calls with a safety, it, this is like one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I was in a, <laughs> on the floor of a manufacturer and they were trying to show me 
where they thought that they needed a safety relay. And I refused to go into their machine because it was not protected. And they were like, but we need to show you where it is. And I said, I don't care where it is. I'm not walking into that machine. Like, you're not going to get me into that machine. I don't care what happens. And, you know, the sales guys, you know, can get frustrated and say, like, we need to see this. It, ultimately, that is the, the way you need to take and see safety. I, I think those are some really good points. So I actually have a I have a story uh, to share. Um, as Vlad says, uh, the, the names will be foregone to protect the, the not so innocent. Right. So I think that there are lots of stories about like really good safety and like th this is like positive safety culture, which is which is where I want to go next on, on safety culture and how to breed it. Th this is a story to a relatively smaller company. Right. So smaller company, uh, food and bev company. Uh, I was out looking at, at something uh, for a completely different job. And, and I turned to the left with another gentleman also named Dave. And, and we see a guy measuring on this big old scale a whole bunch of white powder right and i don't know about you guys but anytime i see someone measuring like large quantities of white powder i'm like what what is this person doing and and on top of that he had a forced air on, on his head one one of the ones that had uh the the uh like the, the tyvek the, the white stuff that goes all the way down so you can tuck it into the suit or you can tape it into the suit he had no suit on right just just the forced air and so we're like what is he doing and so at some point he like he walks away very quickly and there's just white powder strewn everywhere and I'm like this doesn't look good and and I am I'm not the the OSHA representative right I'm not going to go ding everyone on the twenty thousand other unsafe practices this organization was doing but but as the gentleman walks by we're like man what were you what were you measuring and, and long story short he was measuring powdered caffeine just straight caffeine. And the reason why he walked away so quickly is because his fingers were tingling because of all of the caffeine he got on it. And and I'm like, wait, you weren't wearing a suit. You weren't wearing gloves. You were in a forced air respirator. And this powdered caffeine is like just strewn around like basically the entire room. He's like, yeah, but I wetted most of it down. And like you go and he's just like covered in like streaks of, of like just streaks of like wet splat splashes of caffeinated liquid on him and uh and yeah no one in the entire organization was worried other than dave and myself and so that was one of those mo that, that was one of those moments where it's you have to tell everyone and so we told basically everyone upward in the organization because that's going to kill someone right so th th there are always the we don't wear proper rigging when we climb and there's the i'm about to go kill myself and no one seems to know or no, no one seems to care. So I, I think kind of the culture is uh, is very important, very much to kind of everyone and especially Vlad's kind of earlier comments of, hey, these are the rules. This is what we do. We only do it this way. If you're going to do it in a different way, you can go work somewhere else. And, and I, I think that, that that is very important. And, and to kind of to the other comments, I think it's very important to say this could or might get me killed, I'm not going to go work the process or I'm not going to go walk into the machine that you need to put a safety relay in because it doesn't have a safety relay. Like, can, can no one else see the irony in that? I, I appreciate the irony, Zach. Uh, if, if no one else listening listens, I, I appreciate the irony. So um, I want to I start with Vlad. Vlad, have you seen an organization either do something to turn around a bad safety culture or do something or some things to kind of continue to re reinforce a positive safety culture? Yeah, and I, I want to, I guess, like make a comment to the previous discussion as well and answer your question, Dave. I think at least from the automation standpoint, right, because I, I think there's different areas as we discussed, there's maybe like the process safety and then there's the automation or more like electrical focus safety. And I think those two are not necessarily separate, but there's a lot of nuances in each that make them unique in their own way. And I, again, like referring back to what I've seen, I think a strong electrical safety culture requires someone with an electrical background, at least like somewhere higher up in that organization. Um, and again, maybe to, Piggyback on Zach's earlier comments on the OSHA inspectors, I feel that the same could be said about EHS personnel in companies where without a strong electrical background, it's usually very hard to fill those gaps, right? And I think 
electricity is intrinsically much more difficult to understand for everyone. So it becomes harder to, you know, like to the to the previous point that Zach made, I think it's a very good one to speak up. But a lot of times the point, and we have a comment also like in the chat on that same notion, it's not always well perceived because those dangers are not as easily understood and seen by people right so like david like your example you could see the powder you could see maybe the physical effects but the dangers of electricity or understanding what an e-stop must do or how the machine operates it's a lot more difficult for someone with without an electrical background to grasp so i think like there's still room for improvement on that but i would say again I, i've not seen a company turn it around but i've seen it maintained by having a committee inside of the EHS practice that has someone with a very strong electrical and automation background, at least from the electrical side, right? Like purely coming in from that side. Interesting. John, what are your thoughts on that? So I have a, <clears throat> I have a little story too. Um, I, I didn't mention, but a lot of people know I, I was a professor for seven years with Purdue. And so uh, power and controls were, was were what I liked to teach. And uh, we would go to the power plant. So if I was at Purdue West Lafayette, we would use the power plant down there as a tour, uh, get the students out there to see the actual big boilers and all that fun stuff. Uh, and then I'm teaching up in Northern Indiana in South Bend. And so there's this other university that has a campus up here and a slightly smaller uh, um, uh, power plant. And I, they would allow me to come to their, their site and, and do a tour. Uh, I actually had a student that was working at that facility also. So he would do our tour, but after he graduated, one of their on staff um, individuals uh, gave us a tour and I wasn't paying attention as, you know, I'm making sure students are walking, you know, forward, forward, forward and letting the tour guide go. We go in, I'm marching them into the room as, as they go into the room and, and I step in there and it was the main switchgear room. It was the main switchgear room. Yes. Uh, all of them, all my students against a, a tile, 1950s tile wall, you know, the orange tile I'm talking about, standing there looking at the switch gear, all smiling because they don't know what I know. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, thank you. As we walk past brooms, you know, sitting in there in a mop. And I'm like, okay, thank you. You know, we let them go and move them through. So the, the culture, it ultimately, if you looked at what we knew in the late 90s, it was perfectly okay for us to walk through that room because we had three feet between us and that door. We met the 36 inch distance. It doesn't work today, right? There, we, we acknowledge arc flash is the thing and we understand all these other pieces. So safety and culture has to evolve also along the way. And, and it's not that the individual that walked me through that room and my students through that room, which we had an entire lecture on after, you know, we were home and safe. Um, <laughs> it's you gotta you gotta think about this you know that that kind of a pattern is you've got to educate them too and say hey you know i did this once you know we mentioned that we can't do the butt right mm -hmm. there are some times where we don't know about the butt right and we have to walk them through that process and and a lot like what you saw there dave too with your with your caffeinated powder mm -hmm. how many of us have gone into a machine shop where the room is aspirated in machine oil. I mean, you can see the fog, right? And those guys are working and you, you're they're They're just breathing that in all day long. And so there's a lot of what, are, how do we get that along the way? And, and, and just, it's, it's, they're not doing it purposefully. Right. I really mm -hmm. don't think there's a Mr. Burns out there saying I'm going to save $10 and, yeah. you know, and, and go down this way. So it, it isn't, it isn't malice, really, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Has the I, I would agree. Changed I was... since? Sorry, What's sorry. that? Has the tours changed since? I, I haven't back? gone back. So, but, uh, but no one has died. You haven't lost an entire class of students uh, <laughs> there yet, have you, John? I, I, think, I think that would be hard to suppress in the news. So okay. I think... <laughs> that, 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 that was my thought as well. And to, to John's point... I would say I generally agree. I don't think that people ignore safety because they're trying to save ten dollars on on the correct parts, right? I think it's it's ignorance, right? I think most of the time it's the 
oh, I can do it this way because it's always been done this way or I saw someone do it this way or the, hey, I really need to climb up on this shelving unit and then step on the forklift in order to get the thing on the top level. It's okay because I've done it three times before and it's always okay until it's not. I think it was, it was Zach who made the comment of OSHA generally isn't there to go try to bang you up. Generally, they have to show up because a major incident has occurred. And then when a major incident occurs, that's when you find all of the other minor incidents. And uh, I, I would I would absolutely uh, agree with that. Uh, Zach, w- what are your thoughts? Have you seen kind of safety culture, good safety culture begets good safety culture? Have you seen any organizations able to kind of turn things around? Yeah, that, <laughs> it, it's hard it's hard to quantify just how difficult it is to to foster a good safety culture because you're always going to see it at some point. You're ne- you're almost never going to see it when it starts. And you're never going to see it when it ends. You're going to see the aftermath of either, right? And so when, when you think of a company, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about safety, we think of these large conglomerates that are building masses of amounts of machines everywhere. And, and the reality, especially in the United States, is the majority of businesses in the United States are not large. They are very small businesses. And, and as an owner operator or someone that's trying to, to make ends meet, you know, to, to produce something, a lot of times the idea that something costs more and doesn't show its worth, like you can get too into numbers, right? So if, if I'm looking at it and I'm purely going by a spreadsheet, you know, safety requires that there is forced maintenance on things. Safety requires that there might be downtime if someone hits an e-stop. There might be, you know, an issue if something is not connected properly. So there's ways to look at it where you're thinking, gosh, I'm just adding more problems. But you shouldn't look at safety as I'm adding more problems to it. The problem exists. Safety needs to be there because the problem exists. And that's, Mm -hmm. you know, glad you kind of started this by saying, if I don't touch it, I don't have to fix it. Right. And that's a lot of what people think is with safety. If I, I'm going to have to find something, then I'm going to have to fix it. Well, if you're thinking about it that way, I can see why you're not doing anything, but you should always be thinking improvement. Right. There are problems. I should fix those problems to the best of my ability. Now, the one thing I always uh, when I, I would teaching classes on safety, I would always start everybody off by saying safety is not binary. It is not a zero and is not a one. Right. You can't be completely safe and you can't be completely, well, you could probably be completely unsafe by literally doing nothing and intentionally hurting yourself. But the there is no completely safe. You need to think of safety as a risk factor or, or you know, I could go outside today and there is an off chance that I get hit by space station junk from the sky, right? It's a very, very, very small chance that that would happen. But as long as I'm outside, that chance exists. Right. And that we call that um, having, you know, acceptable risk. And and when you have a machine and you're looking at your machine in your facility, you need to figure out and, and you should do this periodically with your machines. If it's in your in your facility, is there an acceptable amount of risk in this machine or am I beyond an acceptable amount of risk? Is, is it endangering my workers by not having a light curtain here? Because because I, I also saw this in chat. You can go the uh, complete other direction, right? I, I've been in a, and, and the sales guy again hated me on this one because the person was <laughs> completely over designing their system. They were going to spend almost $47,000 on light curtains to protect against everything that could or would happen in their system. When the answer was just put a cage around it. And, and, and they were like, what do you mean? And I was like, just put a cage. Like, I don't understand why you're using all this stuff. Just put a cage around it and then have one place to get in and get out. And they're like, well, how does that protect people? I was like, because they can't get through the like they can't get through the <laughs> cage. Like this this imaginary beam that you can't see. Yes, it is part of the safety function. Yes, it will stop the machine. Not everything has to be super technical. There are very simple ways of safeguarding people against problems. And 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 to me, that is like that is the hardest part of doing safety is not seeing it as an expense not seeing it as a way to waste money because when I'm, you know, very small, I can see it as an added expense or wasting money, but also seeing it as an improvement on my machine and my facility. 
and, and using it that way and making sure that I'm making the improvements necessary to make me a better facility, make me better at producing. I have, I mean, and now I'm getting into a whole grandstand. You told me not the grandstand, Dave, at the beginning, but I, I'm going to do it anyways. How much does it cost to train an employee? Right. And yeah. It, that's the first thing I would ask anybody that says I have, I'm safe enough and I don't want to spend, you know, a hundred dollars on a safety relay. Right. Okay. I get it. A hundred dollars might price you out of where your competition is. How much does it cost to train an employee? Probably six weeks until or that employee at least goes through all the training and then until they're functionally good at their job, maybe a couple months. I, I, it depends on the job. It might even be longer than that. Like if you get hurt on a machine, that's downtime for every, everybody should be embracing safety and saying, we need to protect things. And, and John, it looked like you wanted to jump in there. So no, yeah, there I'll was stop. there was a couple things there. But so the first big thing, Zach, you you're saying what I have said if, if you've seen me a few times, the right tool for the right job. You you can you can put bubble wrap around everything if you wanted it, but just throw a cage on it and you don't get in there, right? So it is the right tool for the right job. So Vlad, back to your very first question, we're engineers. Our job is to keep it simple, right? The, the the keep it simple, stupid principle, right? It really is. What is I personally like to overcomplicate is, things, but I I, I agree. Yeah. Um, it is true. <laughs> and one of one of the other things, <laughs> one of the other pieces that I always wanted to, I, I've always used, is the half, glass half full, glass half empty, pessimist optimist. The engineer says that the vessel is now twice the size of the the the, the need, right? We have to, we, we are supposed to put it in budget. Constraints are part of, dollars are actually part of our constraints and designs. And so if you're, if you're overcomplicating it, you're making it now harder to manage, harder to uh, maintain, harder to design, harder to build, harder to run, and less, and harder to make money off of. So, so there's those pieces. Um, there was another piece that I wanted to say there, Zach, and, and, uh, but because you were making a lot of really good points. So I, I'm sure I know my soapbox. And I, I, I don't no, no, it. it was it. I, I know we were told not to do that, but we're the ones that we're the, we're the guests, right? So we get to do what we want. Yeah, um, we don't have to listen <laughs> to you, <we're> live, right? <laughs> um, but so yeah, the 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 right tool for the right job is really the the answer I have. Absolutely. So I think those are all really good comments uh, to to Zach's previous grandstand. I would also agree. I have never seen the cost-cutting mentality lead any organization to success. Uh, most of the time, you, you cut, you cut, you cut, and you start losing th the best people you have. So, so we need to thank some people. But, but first, I actually have a funny uh, cost-cutting uh, safety, uh, safety story. So I, I was at a facility. Um, I was talking to a bunch of operators over the course of one day. And they had the strangest reoccurring issue um at the company of of any organization i've ever been to at some point they just removed all of the box cutters and i'm like well you guys open like 50 pallets of things every day what do you mean they remove the box cutters they're like there are no box cutters we just want box cutters and i'm like this is the strangest and easiest request that i could ever possibly fix we can go like you line you guys a box of box cutters for tomorrow so i, I do a little bit more digging and a uh, long story short, it's actually the safety guy who has removed all the box cutters from the floor because people cut themselves with it. I don't know how often you have to cut yourself with a box cutter in order to have all box cutters removed when you need box cutters to to do your job. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a very interesting organization. Uh, I want to continue on the safety conversation, but first we have some people to thank, uh, and we want to thank uh, Phoenix Contact for for sponsoring this entire theme in this entire month of August. We're going to talk about a cool collaboration between Phoenix Contact and Solus PLC. So glad you hold up your PLC next. We're going to talk about, so if you guys have been paying attention, I've been harassing Vlad for months and months about launching a, a PLC next course, and he has finally done it. In fact, he didn't and didn't even tell me about it, which is why we're going to continue to talk about it. Uh, so Solus PLC is the training site that Vlad runs. We have not embarrassed Vlad, so everyone wave to Solus PLC for the couple of dozen or the few hundred people currently watching, and please subscribe to Solus PLC. But we want to talk about the, the Solus PLC course uh, on plc next and so 
Uh, so, so what do we have here? It basically get it covers on how to get started with the entirety of the PLC Next platform, right? It creates the program flows, how to implement ladder logic, structured text, and function block uh, based on the IEC 61131 standards, uh, as well as dealing with external communication. So there's a whole list of things that it includes. You can check all of that out on solusplc.com. But we want to talk a little bit more about the PLC next and how could we have a safety conversation without talking about the SPLC 1000, which is a PLC extension, PLC next extension module, which turns it into a pro safe controller. Uh, I didn't know it existed. I Vlad didn't know it existed. And he's built the course. So, Zach, we want to throw it over to you to talk a little bit about this extension module, please. Yeah, so thanks, Dave. It's uh, first first and foremost, thank you very much for having me, and, and thank you for really partnering with PLC Next and all these trainings. Mm -hmm. You guys have been fantastic with everything that you do. Um, so the SPLC 1000 is a brand new product from Phoenix Contact. It is a left-hand extension for PLC Next, so that means it is a hardware piece that goes to the left of the PLC Next uh, controller. Uh, like Dave said, it allows you to become a ProfiSafe controller. You can connect up to 32 uh, F address devices. So that's 32 drops of IO. It can be IP20, IP67. As long as it's Profi safe, it will work on the, the PLC Next uh, SPLC 1000. And it is, you know, in terms of budget, I saw somebody in here, you know, asking, what do you add for safety? Is it $5,000? You know, I can only talk about the US and how we list price it. It's right around you know, four or $500 for a, a hardware piece that goes right onto your controller. So you can take a controller that already is under $1,000, turn it into a, a, a full-blown Profi-Safe controller, and you know, you're right around $1,000 there for a, a really nice you know, open PLC. And you don't lose any of the open functionality, too. That's the other thing I, I want. Just because you're adding safety to it doesn't mean you lose uh, openness on PLC next. You, you can actually do safe C function. So it's, uh, it's pretty neat there. I, Vlad, I know that probably got you thinking, like, oh, man, safe C <laughs> function. I got to see how that works. So... Uh, certainly something we can talk uh, deeper about or maybe do another another video uh, specifically on how that works. But that it is a left left side add-on module to give you safety on PLC next. One, that, that is awesome. Th thank you, Zach. I, I feel like every time Zach comes on, he tells us something new about PLC next that I don't know if anyone knew. So if you guys remember back last fall, Zach was telling us about the PLC Next Edge Gateway that I don't even know if it was like actually launched when we started talking about it. So, it uh, so not. thank you. It was not. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. So I, is the SPLC 1000, has that extension module been launched? So in uh, globally, yes, it's been launched. And then I believe here in the United States, we are currently setting it up. So if you have, if you have need for it, um, uh, contact your local Phoenix contact distributor and we can get people in talking about it. And I can't Fantastic. show it here because, you know, with, uh, <laughs> I would love to have them here, but I think my sales team would probably kill me if they saw I was hoarding product in, in my house. So I, I don't have one here. <laughs> exactly. So Phoenix contact sales team, Vlad is currently hoarding product. He is the person you need, you need, you need to go find. Uh, but, but no, so thank you, Zach. And again, thank you to, uh, to Phoenix contact for uh, continuing to, uh, to sponsor this and sharing all of the amazing PLC next things that you guys are doing. Good news, Vlad has at least four entire more courses of PLC next stuff uh, to come out. So go go check out the first course on Solus PLC. Um, yeah, go check out the first course and go get your hands on some PLC next and build cool stuff and share it with us. Dave, really appreciate that. I did want to follow up. Zach mentioned briefly the comment that was made on the LinkedIn page. And I think that almost segues us into an interesting conversation slash maybe something to watch out for. And I wanted to get maybe John's and Zach's like feedback on that again. But Dante is asking, what is a minimum figure on a typical machine? Do you generally allocate a percentage for safety on a machine? For example, adding 5,000 pounds to a quote for safety. You know, and I guess like, let's like expand that a little bit. What, um, like, is there a rule of thumb or is it pretty much, uh, you know, it, it must meet a certain standard and it can, it can be anywhere from $100 to, you know, $50,000 on any given machine? Is, is there anything that you can start with or guesstimate for a project? 
Wow. <laughs> Go ahead, John, if you want to start. Well, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. L- <laughs> let me jump in and give John a couple of seconds to uh, to think about it. I, th- I think it's a good question. I-, I would say that, in my opinion, when building a machine or building a facility, you shouldn't look at safety as a cost adder, right? Like, it should be baked into the cost of the system, right? So we, we know we're going to have at least one e-stop. We're going to have some some safety circuits. We're going to have some relays, we're going to have fuses. We're going to have all of these safety features, but safety is a cost to go ahead and, and build the panel or, or to build the machine. So I think first we should think about it as it's, it's part of the overall cost, as opposed to you can have this very unsafe machine for $10,000 or the safe machine for $15,000. Uh, so I, w- I will go ahead and try to start us off on that. And hopefully I give you a couple of seconds to uh, to think about that, John. Yeah. So, I mean, thanks, but, but yeah, I mean, what, it, what does a seat belt and brakes uh, add to a cost of a car? Would you, would you buy a car without a seat belt and brakes? How about an airbag now? Right. So, you know, those are, that's where I'm, that's where I come from as if I'm doing a design, right. If you ask me to design a machine again, it's a machine, right. And there's a list of things that if, if JPDC is going to build a, a design a machine for you, build a machine for you, there is no question that's what it is. That comes with that process. So, so I don't know how to say, uh, uh, I, you know, how many pounds you want to add to it. I, I assume we're we're British here, so we're talking British pounds. How many euros you want to add? How many dollars you want to add? The the dollar amount is just what the machine is, and it it evolves over time, right? So. Uh, again, when I was designing machines in, in the early 2000s, I didn't worry about, I just did a regular a, a, a stop without an e-stop relay. Why? Because there weren't e-stop relays, but now an e-stop relay exists. A safety relay exists. Oh, look, there, you know, each of those things add to the system because it we learned something. We've evolved. It's a crazy thing, you know, as we as we grow. Um I so what do you what do you think, Zach? What do you, yeah, I, I mean, I think you hit it on the head there, John. There's You shouldn't be looking at it as an after-the-fact thing. And I know maybe that comes from somebody that's updating equipment or things like that. One thing I will say is that I've talked with, you know, people that run their own um, safety services teams or, or they do safety services or offer, you know, safe inspection and things like that. And they actually use cost of inspection and, and things like that to see how serious you are about safety. And, and they will say that if you call in and we start talking about, you know, what your needs are and what you're looking to do, a, a general, you know, just come in and look at our machine. We'll figure out what it is. The general term that they would use, and this is just, a you know, two or three examples combined as one analogy, but it $5,000. If, if they say $5,000 and you bulk at it, you know, you're probably not ready for safety or you don't have a culture of safety that really matters. So in, in their mind, it's, I'm not going to waste my time with your business if you're going to balk at five thousand dollars. Now, I, I could already see the comments coming in. Well, geez, you know, five thousand dollars, depending on the machine. You know, if I'm just making something small, yeah, I, I get it. It can be scaled. You know, but but ultimately, like John said, your the end product is important, and safety should be part of that end product from the start. So if you're not talking about safety from the start, then it is going to see be seen as an adder and you're going to be seeing it as, Oh gosh, well, I had my design, but now I have to add this to it. Well, no, your first design was inadequate and now you're adding on to it because, and plug your ears, all your millennial engineers like me, you're a bad engineer, right? If, if you didn't bring it in to start with, and you didn't think about it to start with, you're a bad engineer and you should feel bad and you should fix it next time. Right. And <laughs> I'm sorry to be blunt, but that's just, you know, that's the way it is. <clears throat> I, I've always said to my students, the job of an engineer is to keep uh, uh, more people not dead this year than we did last year, right? We like learned. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> let, let me ask a follow-up question, uh, maybe towards that our goal as engineers is to keep more people less dead <laughs> next year than this year. Um, I, I don't not. know. I, I, I not, not dead, yes, yes. Kill less people next year than we did this year. Uh, uh, I, we just have to put it in Latin, and that's going to be the crust of manufacturing hub uh, from from now on. So when, when we talk about safety, like so, safety is something that should be built in. 
are there options for like safe and more safe? Like, is there safe? This is the way do we do it? Or is there safe? And then we can be like extra super safe as an additional level in tier. I mean, Zach pointed out with risk factor, what's your risk risk factor? What, what number is, is the number? So a hundred percent safe is an unattainable factor. We just, Mm -hmm. it's just not a thing. And then, and then you come down on price because it does come to price, right? Where, where is, where is your acceptable level of, of safety? So let's say a 0.7 to a a 1.0, right? Now, where can your price value fit in there? And the closer to the 1.0, the better. Um, I mean, I, and then it also comes in that 0.7, right? I, I've said multiple times, a machine is a machine. The sump pump in my basement doesn't have an e-stop on it, but it is a machine, right? You know, it, it is a controlled system, but mm-hmm. it does have a means of disconnecting. It does actually have an e-stop. It unplugs. That is mm-hmm. an e-stop, right? So um, it's just what is the level of safety that needs to be involved in that, right? And where where is the safety coming from? Back to my sump pump. There is a GFI on it because it's sitting in water, but that's designed purpose because of supplying to it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there are pinch points. Are those pinch points significant that we need a cage around it? No, right? So now we've decided it's okay for my kid to get his finger pinched on that little limit switch. It's okay because it's (laughs) only a Band-Aid, right? Because that's a a level of factor that we're willing to observe, right? Um, if, if we have a quick second, I do have a story with, that I was thinking on back in my very first days of, of designing buildings and doing electrical contracting in uh, buildings in Houston. I had a 20-story building that I did in a bid on, uh, the Houston uh, Downtown Convention Center. So if you ever go to the Rock, Rockwell uh, show down there, that, that hotel attached to it, I won that bid. But um, we had to factor in on that bid the life of three, the cost of three men. It, because we, the, the, the insurance company said in a two year period of building this 20 story building, you're going to lose the cost of three men. Okay. And it, and, and by the way, it's a hundred grand at, at, in, in 2001, it was a hundred grand ahead. So I had to add $300,000 to my bid because the insurance <clears throat> company said I had to have that on hand for workman's comp and OSHA violations. A guy was going to cut his finger with a box cutter, right? It didn't get to the end where we didn't spend that three hundred thousand at the very top. You know, we you know spartaned them off the top because hey, <laughs> paid for three guys, but but it's a risk factor that has to go into the, the cost of doing business, right? Yeah, it and to go along with that, John. I mean, if you go to the the more application based standards like thirteen eight four nine or 61508 or 61511, they walk you through this, right? It, it is in those standards, the, the risk assessment that is needed to be done. And it starts with how dangerous is it? Um, you know, I can picture 13849 in my head right now. The very first question you ask for any machine is, is the injury reversible so while it's severe or not severe? Which the answer is, is it reversible or not reversible? So, you know, and, and to that, can I grow a finger back? No, I can't. So that would be an unreversible injury. And then it goes to, well, how often are you in the danger zone? Okay. And then how preventable is it once you're there? And, you know, for a standard just machine, that's kind of where it's at. But then you get to the larger processes. It, it, the danger is, um, you know, not dangerous, uh, single death, several deaths, up to three, and then many deaths, which is more than three. So that is literally the first question you ask is if something goes wrong here, how many people are going to be affected by it in a permanent way, right? And mm-hmm. it, you, you can't not have that discussion. You, you have to think about it that way in order to protect yourself properly. Otherwise, you're going to end up putting, you know, 36 light curtains on a bubble machine. And it's like, <laughs> that, that's not me. And, and that's, where, that's where I hit the, we got to keep people less dead next year than, than yeah. we do. That, that's the question, really. And and when you pose it in that way, that that sticks in your head, and then you go look up these answers and say, oh, "How do I do this process?" Doctor, yeah, it, it, it does job, that study, if I may ask, like, like a really kind of side question: Who typically does that, uh, you know, questionnaire and figures out this? Is that an EHS lead at like a site? Is that like a contractor? Is there a group? Like, what's the standard procedure? To figure that out for injuries and death on site. 
Well, like for for a new machine, let's say if I'm like a, if I'm a oh. plant like manager and I'm trying to bring in some piece of machinery, who's going to figure figure out that stuff? So I mean, you could you could pay a a a um, team to come in and do it, right? I would say that the best way to do it, and, and the way that it's outlined in the standard that we use at Phoenix Contact, which is EN twelve one hundred, as our risk assessment standard that we use in our facility when we're adding new things. Um, it tells you to get a multifaceted group within the organization. So mm -hmm. you're not just okay. getting the people that are working on the machine. You're not just getting the managers of that machine. You're getting all walks of life, people that will be walking near it, people that will be supervising it. And, and the very first thing that you do is you figure out what the machine does and it, you figure out the limits of the machine. So how much is it weigh? How much current does it use? Um, what is the process for it? And so it, it is... It is really an unsung job for the people that are on the safety team and people that that do these safety assessments within a facility, but they're very important because, you know, if you think about it, the person that is not using that machine is more likely to see the problems with it than the person that is using that machine because they've been around it. Yeah. So they, they've gotten used to the risk. They know what's going on. It's the person that is not around it that would be like, Ooh, I'm not putting my fingers in there. Like, Ugh, no, thank you. And, and so, that is really, you know, find a standard for risk assessment. There are plenty of them out there um, and just start start developing a team and, and figure out basically what is acceptable risk, what is not acceptable risk, how do you design around it, and then how do you implement safety things that'll reduce the risk of a, something bad happening. And and then the got you is it's a living document because every yep. once now you've, you've defined the risk of that, that machine. And then you get the engineers to engineer around that salute, you know, to find yeah. that solution. And now you got to do that risk again because you may have created new. Yep, exactly. It, it, every every risk assessment thing you'll see is basically a loop that comes back around. It's check for new check for new problems. And and I'd like to point out. Uh, so earlier this year we talked about cybersecurity, right? So NIST has very similar guidelines for when you look at cybersecurity, right? They have similar questionnaires and I'm sure John has problems with them, but but my, my commentary is more towards when you go look at what risks become, it's what is the monetary cost of, of downtime, et cetera, but also what is the potential human cost, right? Mm -hmm. So if uh, for very simple terms, if my facility can get hacked and we can blow it up and there are 50 people inside and those 50 people could possibly die, Right. There are there are large risks when we go and look at risks. So risks are both physical, machine wise, system wise, but also cybersecurity. And it is something that more organizations should do. We should we should go through these steps on a regular basis because they should be living documents than just when insurance or the federal government or whomever mandates we go through them. And we should actually pay attention to the outcomes of those. I, I I made my face when you said that because we it seems that there's an active move uh, to not worry about cybersecurity and cyber issues or network designs in in the uh, NFPA document right now. So okay, I, I would I would hope that somebody maybe in the the world here will make public comment that says we should we should add some 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 literature to that and and push some folks. So you have that power on on all of the NFPA documents is even if you're not part of the NFPA, the region. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And to, Interesting. to that end, the I think the recent revision of 61508 did add a cybersecurity piece to it. So it, it is being adapted to other safety documents and they go hand in hand. And and that's that's the reason why uh we're we're not doing it is we wait. We are a waiting board. <laughs> Interesting. Very interesting. So I know we've got a bunch of, of additional comments. Uh, we'll, we'll take a couple of minutes to go through those. Uh, but first, I want to give everyone an opportunity to uh, to kind of wrap up. If you guys have any closing thoughts on safety, good, bad, indifferent, uh, yeah, good, good, bad or indifferent. Vlad, what are your what are your closing thoughts? Well, my closing thoughts are maybe closing question, if I may, Dave. Like the one, you know, be, before we give those thoughts, uh, and maybe like a more fun fundamental question, because I know we had that in the comments as well. But um, maybe trying to understand the difference between safety rated components and non-safety rated components, right? And I'll throw in like, I guess like a few 
examples and i think like dave made a recent post and we all saw the the video of a robot that uh, injured like the finger of a of a child right and so i think there's often I, I, bringing this back to maybe like automation there's misconception of just because we're using a safety rated controller well like the process is safe inherently right and i've seen i'll throw in like a few examples where you know we have a rate a safety rated let's say like prox or you know one of those like sensors that when you open the gate it e-stops the machine and then you can like break the guard and we'll get to john in just a second but yeah. again for better or for worse that sensor breaks down because of a washdown, a maintenance or what have you and then it gets replaced by a regular prox and an experienced controls engineer can certainly like bypass the the requirements on whichever card but we're not going to get into that discussion so i'm just wondering you know on a fundamental level the difference between those devices and what maybe have you seen in the field kind of maybe i, I want to say like challenges and opportunities to improve uh, well I, first, I'll, I'll start john oh go ahead dave uh, i was going to say first if you like things like vlad absolutely derailing the end of the conversation <laughs> by throwing a bomb into it you can, one, uh, hit, hit the middle of the bingo score where Vlad says I have lots of questions and then add lots of questions. And two, please remember to like and subscribe on Manufacturing Hub on any of the uh, podcast and or video platforms. Zach, it could be I, a I teaser couldn't... for the next uh, episode of the same, but anyways, that's... <laughs> it, it, it could be. Zach, what, what, are your, what, what are your thoughts and comments on, uh, on Vlad? So I'm glad I might have met somebody you're related to at some point in my career, because I remember it was probably the second year I was in doing safety and I was giving, you know, I was at a distributor and they were having a fair and I was talking about, you know, safety rated components and why you need them. And, and I kept saying safety relay and it wasn't a question and answer, but a gentleman in the first three rows raised his hand while I was presenting and I, I asked him to stand up and he goes, you keep saying safety relay. And I just want everybody to know, Safety relay is a marketing term, and there is no such thing as a safety relay, that there are only safety ah! rated relays. And I, you know, for the sake of not arguing with him, I agreed. But if you think about it, the difference between a safety component and a non-safety component in the grand scheme of things is that a safety component has probably been uh, applied for and sent to a testing facility to be tested under a certain standard, right? Um, and, and this is the English language somewhat fails us in this because if you say safety relay and you search safety relay on Google, you will get elementary style component relays that go inside of a you know safety relay case. And then you will also get safety relays which are predetermined functions that need to be wired in certain um, ways to function. And they are already uh, you know submitted to the TUV or to Exit or whatever third party vendor you're using for it and they have a specific function. And so the answer to your question, Vlad, is it, it's been submitted, um, but you know, you could technically, and, and what they, you know, to John's point, what did you do before there was safety components? You know, you basically started adding redundancy and triple redundancy, and there's different ways to calculate when failure will occur, right? And the best thing about a safety component is those calculations have been tested and should have been done for you so that you can basically by looking at a sheet and putting into a simple calculation say, I should not have a failure occur in the lifetime of this machine based on my usage and I should feel okay up to a certain risk level using it. And that's that's the difference between a safety component and a non-safety component is, is math and certification. Yep, it, because we're an engineer, right? So yep. it, it allowed us to, it allows us to simplify our process and worry about other things because somebody else already worried about that. And that's what the hundred dollars extra is for. The five hundred dollars yeah. extra is for because it's paying for your time and energy in, in doing those calculations or two or three other non-safety rated relays so that you have redundancy. Um, yeah. And and I I will say an an emergency stop isn't necessarily a safety gate opening. It's designed, right? Because if you open the gate and you close the gate and the machine continues to start, that was a category two, not a one or a zero. Mm -hmm. And so it was not an emergency stop. So right. you'd have to reset the, it. And yeah, the, the, right. There was no reset required. The reset was just closing the door. And so the reset happened, right? So um, those are, those are, it. it's just terms. 
but engineering uses terms on purpose for certain things. Like when I ask the question of my of my class, every time I start a, a room and we talking about electricity, I ask who has been electrocuted, please raise their hand. <laughs> and people raise their hand. And I go, well, that's cool. That means you're dead. You know, so because to be electrocuted means you've been killed. You have been shocked, just never electrocuted. You know, so terms mean things. Ask somebody what's the difference between common, neutral, and ground. Mm, duh, that's, oh, that's, oh God. That, that's an entire hour and a half conversation, too. I so, was going to say, there, there is not enough time on this show to, uh, to have that discussion. No. So, so it is about terms. It's about keeping it simple. It's about designing it right to the best of your ability and best of your constraints. That's it. That's what's okay. safe. Amazing. Uh, Vlad, l l let's let's go back to you and ask do you have any like uh closing uh thoughts to uh to finish up this episode and then we'll go check uh, any questions in the comments again i mean i would say like the thought that's going through my head again never having seen an organization transform uh, from like a bad to a good safety culture is how difficult it would be i i think you know like my, my general thought again it was is that it will take a lot of effort and a lot of buy-in at every level. I, I think I'll leave it at that. But uh, what are your, what is your closing thought? Zach? I, I, I would say as, as much as I, I think OSHA gets a bad rap for what they do, and, and at times an OSHA inspector can be frustrating, at, I think is, is probably the best term I could say, you know, when you're trying to get something out the door and they're trying to inspect something. But ultimately, I have seen organizations that have been fined by OSHA right, that have taken it seriously, changed the way that they do things. And it it ultimately took, you know, a $125,000 penalty with, you know, the requirement that they fix it within six weeks. And we're going to come back and inspect this exact same thing. And if it's not done, you're getting fined, you know, three times the amount. And is is that a great way to do it? And should we always, you know, you know, look at the hand slap and say, gosh, that's the only way to fix things? No, but a lot of times that's the only way to get people to notice, especially when you're talking about money and, and what safety costs. You know, if you're looking at it that way, a lot of times money is the way to get it to go the other direction. So I think it's it's effective. I think if you look at other countries, there's other ways to do it where you look at safety as somewhat holistic view. You know, for instance, you know, we're a German company, so I know a lot about German safety. Basically, you're responsible for safety from pen to paper to end of the machine as an engineer. So the second I start a design to the second that machine goes, you know, decommissioned, I am responsible for it as an engineer. So that makes me ultimately want to design safety immediately into it and not think about it. The other, like someone will take care of it down the road. So I, I think we do okay here in the United States. I think people are getting better at it. Conversations like this certainly are helpful. It, it helps demystify what is required, even though I don't think John or I told you what was required at the beginning, because uh, there isn't a great answer to it. But, you know, have the conversations, learn as an engineer, keep learning more about safety, read, you know, there's, you know, I'm sure John can tell you when the next NFPA 79 technical review is. You could probably go up and look at the, uh, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot there, John, but you can certainly go look at some of the revisions that they're doing and some of the things, have public comment on it, you know, get involved in safety and be a part of safety in your, in your facility is the easiest way to make that change. The answer to that is we're in process right now. And so public comments are actually closed because it's in production of being printed, but always there's the next, next one too. So pay attention. Um, Absolutely. There, there it is. And, and I think Zach said it fine. He closed quite well here. I, there is to me, uh, my, my being able to go to bed at night and know that I'm not going to harm somebody or somebody's going to be harmed on something that I did is actually more of the driver on what is is the safe there too so um do the best of my ability and do better next time no i, I think that's very good I, I will add that i think that all organizational change is difficult right so it, it's something that i've done professionally in a number of places for a number of years organizational change is difficult that's why we use the word change and all things in change are difficult safety should be at the very core of, of any good organization, right? 
more people, less dead. Like uh, like John said, we're going to get that translated into Latin or maybe French, and it's it's going to go on the crest, right? But I I think at the core that should be what what you hope to do, and you should hope to empower everyone at your organization to say, no, this is a problem. If it's a problem, we need to fix it, right? If someone is going to get seriously or grievous grievously grievously injured, then we need to go fix the problem so that so something bad doesn't happen. Uh, I think Zach made a couple of good comments about OSHA. Um, I, I will make uh, a, a comment there towards the end. To the best of my understanding, I say it only because uh, I say it only because I have not done it myself. You can call OSHA and ask them to come in and go review your facility and your safety issues without going and finding you, right? So they can come up with a list of these are, this is what you need to do to be quote unquote safe. And there are certainly organizations that need that culture shock of, oh my goodness, look at all of the ways that people could get seriously hurt or dead. We need to go change this in order to jumpstart it. I will also say almost every organizational change that I've been through, people are going to need to, to go move on to other companies and be fired because there are people who are, who are holding back uh, th that organization from going where they need to be. But no. Zach, uh, John, thank you guys so much. This has been a fantastic, uh, see, I was going to say safety roundtable, but I think we can call it, this has been a fantastic first safety roundtable. Um, we've been talking about it for at least a year, and I feel like at some point in the less than a year period of time, uh, at least the four of us will be back to continue this conversation around safety. Um, if you guys, uh, you guys can please feel free to continue to, to comment um, on the live shows. Uh, Zach, John, Vlad, and myself, we'll, we'll do our very best in order to get back. If you got a specific question for a specific person, please feel free to go ahead and, and tag them in that. Uh, with that, thank you, everyone, for listening. I have learned that if I ask people to like and subscribe, more people like and subscribe, which does amazing things for us. So if you are new to Manufacturing Hub, please feel free to follow Manufacturing Hub, the Manufacturing Hub Network on LinkedIn. Uh, follow myself, follow Vlad, John and Zach's contact information is linked um, on the LinkedIn posts. We'll go ahead and link it to the other places if you are looking, uh, if you're looking for them. Uh, if you're listening on podcast form, please follow us, subscribe, rate us five stars. It helps us in a whole bunch of ways. The the podcast, uh, the podcast numbers continue to trend upward, which means that more of you are listening uh, in the last Vlad's mom is downloading us a thousand times um, every month. Uh, and thank you again to, uh, to Phoenix Contact uh, for all of your support uh, when it comes to this. And we will see everyone Wednesday, 4 o'clock East Coast time. Uh, yeah, next Wednesday, 4 o'clock East Coast time. And next Thursday at some point in your podcast uh, network of choice. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. Nice meeting you.